I'm not going to try to top that. <laughs> Today we have the pleasure of bringing to you, through the Holy Spirit, a friend of mine, a brother in Christ, an encouragement to me for so many years. Uh, his family goes way back in the history of Lake Forest. And, and through tumult and tribulation and through uh, many heartaches and pains and travails, he still loves and expresses his love for the Lord as he did today. If anybody I know could worship more than Wayne Holly, I'm not sure. Maybe Dr. Logan Carson. And if you don't know Dr. Logan Carson, we, we can talk about that one day, but he truly was a man that worshiped on the same plane as my friend, Wayne Holly. Wayne uh, goes back, and, and I remember when he went to college in 2005, and he graduated seminary, served in Shelby, and he went to Weifel, and now at Castle Hayne, and then now here, uh, he comes to us today to bring the Word of God. He asked me what to preach on, and I told him, I said, well, I don't, I don't know about on uh, James, I, that they want to hear anything more about James. <laughs> We've been in for eight months, so you might want to steer clear of James, but if the Holy Spirit says go there, go there. And I might have to apologize to you after he tells you what it really means. But, but it's with love and admiration and great appreciation that in my time of need, even in the midst of a difficult time, he steps up. He says, because I love you. So, brother, I'm not going to embarrass you anymore today. <laughs> we'll hold that for next week. Come bring the word. Well, it's not hard to make me cry. <laughs> oh, goodness. I tell people all the time, if you get me as your pastor, you get the crying pastor. Uh, I am ecstatic to be home. This is home. see a very good friend on the back row. It's good to see you this morning. Yes. Love you. Wow, as Bert said, we have much history here. I shared a little bit Wednesday night, but I feel like I see so many new faces. It's amazing. I remember there was a day I'd have walked in the door and knew every single person and then some when we walked through the doors, which was always really cool. But you know what's really cool? As much as I miss some of those old faces, seeing some new faces, a lot of new faces. That's really cool. I have been around a long time. My mom actually came here. I think she was a young teenager. Miss Jerry, you may know better than me how old she was. I don't have any idea. How old was she? Yeah, so long time ago, her and Miss Jerry and uh, others of their day were very good friends and we were all like family. Siblings, all the kids and always together, but they came here. My dad came, they got married here, and uh, got, he got saved and baptized later on. Um, I remember coming here all the way back, and you guys might not even know this pastor's name, but Pastor Moore, and I remember him so well. My mom says, how do you remember him? I said, I don't know. Those were exciting days for me as a kid. This was an exciting place. I remember this place was packed out. Back in the 1970s, it was so cool. And then to leave, as my parents left to go start a different ministry, but we came back. And when I was about 12, just a few weeks shy of 13, Bert, I met my bride right here. Either here or at school, but either way, we were here in the youth group all the way back then. And it's hard to believe that she has stood by me all these years, because we are no longer 12 or 13, Bert. <laughs> Uh, we have grown kids. They're not even that age anymore. So when I look at my kids, I'm like, how did life go by so fast? But so many incredible things. And I think it was about the year 2000. Noah was a year or so old, our son. And one of my best friends in the entire world, Randy Spate, was pastoring this church. And if anybody knows Randy and knows me, they know how we are. We are just very close and he said, I need you to come here. And I was doing one of what I consider my dream job. 
I was the teaching parent at the Boys and Girls Home in Lake Waccamaw, living with eight at-risk teens. I just couldn't imagine doing anything else at that time. Of course, I was a lot younger and had a lot more energy than I do now. But he called me and said, this is what I want and you're it. And I was like, mm, I don't know that God wants me in church ministry. That would be like a big joke on everybody, including myself. But we came. And I tell people all these years later, without a doubt in my mind, between here as the youth pastor and working at the Boys and Girls Home, I was living the dream. I loved it. Living in the parsonage over off whatever the name, Parmalee. Yeah, just one of my favorite houses we ever lived in, actually, was the church parsonage from this church. All the kids would come over, the college kids would come over, and we'd play, and we'd have a good time. It was so much fun. It was a dream. So when it came time for us to go to school, it was a very difficult decision, but we knew what we had to do. I said Wednesday night, God's love language is obedience, and we have to always be obedient to when God calls. And y'all, you need to understand something else. Not only is it obedience, it's immediacy. When God says do something, you do it immediately. Because if you wait, then it's no longer immediate and it's no longer obedience. Okay? So God's love language is obediency. God called us to leave. And it was one of the hardest decisions of our lives. I left two of the best jobs I think I ever had in my lifetime. But we knew what God called us to do. And we got to seminary or to college with no jobs. <laughs> Went from two jobs for me, one job for her, to no job, to no mortgage, to, or no payments, to having to pay rent and everything else. And God answered every need that we had. And I don't want to point you out too bad, but you met many needs. was always there. He'd always say, what do you need? And sometimes you didn't even ask. You brought things that we needed at the moment. That's a brother. That's your pastor. And I stand in awe of you. So I'm going to apologize now because you guys have one of the best pastors I can imagine. So apologies completely that I'm here with you for the next little while. But uh, I love Bert and I, it was with great excitement that I'm here today, even under these circumstances. And we're praying for you, him, praying for all of you, lifting you up. Um, I feel like I have known him forever. I don't even remember when we met either, but it was a long time ago when it was here. Some of my best friendships, y'all, were here in this church. I remember growing up and running through this place when it was just the carpet through the middle and the rest was wood. You remember that? <laughs> that was a long time ago. So I'm very grateful and thankful for you. And God has called us to many years of ministry. And I get the strangest look when I say I retired from church ministry on August the 22nd. Um, that was an interesting decision that we didn't necessarily see coming. But again, when God says do something, you do it. And this year has been very interesting for us. Life is an adventure all the way around, all the time. But God has called us to an adventure of life in service for him. And we've had an incredible adventure over our lives. God has given us two incredible children. Um, we're amazed at our children, both of them. One of them is here today um, with us, Shauna, and I affectionately call her Lulu. So if you hear me say Lulu, this is who we're talking about. And uh, Noah Shay is our son, and I typically will call him Shay, just because that's what I do. And so the adventure of life has been interesting. God is always working and he's always moving in our lives, and we need to be paying attention with our eyes, right? This past year, God has hit us with some pretty big things. In case some of you who know us for a long time don't know, Isha had cancer for the second time last year. Today, she's cancer-free again, 100%. So we are grateful 
on our 26th wedding anniversary. I was in the, the most incredible place I could have been in for 26 years of marriage, June 1st. This past year, I was in the hospital <coughs> with a heart condition. I was like, how cool is this? I get to be at New Hanover Hospital. <laughs> Getting the best care I could have imagined, right? So I've ended up most of this summer in and out of doctor's offices, in and out of the emergency room, having to have my heart shocked back and all this fun stuff. And here I am still because God has a plan. There's a verse that I've lived my life by, and some people say different things. What would you say? I still make your heart break. You do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I am grateful for my bride. 26 years, Bert. That's a long time. Who would have ever guessed she'd have said I do to start with? How cool is that? But life's an adventure. And I believe I have this person correctly when I say it was Helen Keller said, life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. Life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. Listen, the life of faith that we live as believers, it's a daring adventure and a life of risk or it's nothing at all. You know, I'm going to say this quickly because I think this is very true. If your only experience with Jesus is sitting on a pew on Sunday morning, coming to church, then that's not the life of faith. And you're missing out because there's so much more. Did you hear what I said? There's so much more than sitting on the pew for an hour a week. It's an adventure of living life. And I'm grateful that Lake Forest has all those years there's one man I want to point out very quickly, and then I'm going to jump into my message. O.J. Atkinson. I believe I'm very much the man I am today because of his leadership in my life. RAs. Who, who would have guessed a simple program as RAs would have made such an impact? All my life. So Mr. OJ, love you buddy. Thank you for all that you did. All the bus drives that you had to take <laughs> all those years, all those times. And I think I love kids as much as I do because of him, because the way he loved us. So life is an adventure in the life. And think about those words as they come from somebody like Helen Keller, who was born blind and deaf and unable to speak, and yet she was able to reach outside of her world, and then she was able to say, life is an adventure, or it's nothing at all. This life of faith, you know, we're called to live by faith. That means not by what we see here, but what we see here in the direction that God is taking our lives and listening intently to his voice speaking into our lives. So it's a life of an adventure and risk. Nothing on this side of a situation can we understand. It's when we take that step that everything changes. Everything here may look kind of cloudy and not real certain, but as soon as you say, okay, God, I'm going with you, and it may be out into what looks like nothing to us, but when we take that step, we'll be on solid ground. That's the life of faith that God has called us to live. Think about the lives in the Bible. Noah, we were called to tell the stories of Noah. Noah built an ark in the middle of a desert. Was that faith or what? Think about that. In the middle of a desert, Abraham left his homeland to go to a land that he didn't even know where he was going. God didn't say, this is it right here and point to it on the map. He said, you just go and I'll tell you when you get there. Who wants to take that journey? I mean, really? Who knows? Joshua was told to take the city of Jericho. He was a, a, a commander. He was a, a warrior. But he said, you just march around the city. And then the walls are going to fall. Whew. What do you mean the walls are going to fall just because I marched around the city and blew some trumpets? 
But what happened? The walls fell. Why? Because God said so. Think about that for a second. When God said something, you can count on that. Elijah faced down all the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Queen Esther risked everything to save her people. She risked the throne. She risked her comfortable life, living in the palace, eating the great foods, all to save her people. Daniel refused to defile himself with the king's food. He said, I, all that food looks great, but I can only eat vegetables. Does that sound good to y'all? Not so good, huh? Yeah, not so good. We talked about this guy the other night. Nehemiah lived a cushy job in the palace. We talked about this Wednesday night. But he left everything for that life of adventure to go back to the homeland to build the wall around the city. Think about all those great things that these people were able to accomplish all because they trusted in their big God. You guys have a big God today? Seriously. A big God. They were able to do these things because they had faith in an unlimited big God. And they believed when God said it that it would come to pass, even if they didn't see it in the moment that they were living in. Think about this. What, when your children, if you have children in this room today, when you send them to Sunday school, what people do we tell them about? The same people I just listed. Why? Because that's the people we want them to live up to. That's the kind of people we want them to model their lives around. When Noah was a little boy, two or three years old, he was in Sunday school, and they said, who built the ark? Noah said, I did. <laughs> he's glad he's not here today for me to tell that story. <laughs> because these are the people we hold up to them to live their lives by. Deuteronomy tells us to tell the great stories of our big God, to pass all those stories on. And not just the ones that are in the Bible. There are great people all throughout history who lived lives of faith. We need to tell the story. We need to live the story of people who live lives of faith. I'm going to share one definition with you. We're going to get into our scripture, but faith. The best way I've been able to describe it is believing God to be true and committing your life to Him. That's what faith is to me. Believing God to be true and committing your life to Him. That's the life of faith that God has called us to live. We're going to go into a, a, probably a very familiar story today, but I hope that it will ring true in your ears brand new today and that it will ignite you on fire to live the life of faith. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. So if you have God's word today, would you stand as we honor the reading of God's word if you're able? So in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, immediately, say immediately. immediately. Now say it like you mean it, immediately. immediately. I think I'm going to have to share something with you guys very quickly. I'm not one of those pastors that when I ask you a question, you just sit there silently and look pretty, okay? When I ask a question or ask you to do something, I really mean for you to do it. Is that a good deal? Can we do that? Yeah? yeah? All right. So immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. And he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Say contrary. Contrary. And in the fourth, y'all learned. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately, say immediately, immediately. Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is your command, 
If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Say, come. Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and, beginning to, and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me immediately. Immediately. Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. Father, today would you give us ears to hear, hearts to receive your word, to understand your word, and to respond to your word through the power of your spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to give you a little background to where we're at. John has, the Baptist has been beheaded. Obviously, Jesus is emotional, for lack of a better word, right this second, about the situation. He's gone off to try to get some quiet time. The people follow him because that's what they do. Jesus was just one of those figures everybody wanted to be around wherever he was. And they have followed him and they've come to hear him speak. They've come to hear him do the great miracles and the great healings. And that's where the, the feeding of the 5,000. What an incredible thought that 5,000 people were fed that day. But get this, that was just the men. That was just men. You guys know that, right? Because you women, y'all weren't very important. Y'all didn't get counted. I'm sorry. Y'all have come a long way since then, though, right? <laughs> We're grateful for, for, for that. But think about that for a second. 5,000 plus people were fed with just five loaves of bread and two fish. You see, because nothing is impossible with our big God. Do you believe that today? Nothing is impossible with our big God. So all that has happened, and Jesus says, hey, it's time for them to go. You got to get in the boat to his friends, the people he sent away to the other side. I love this word because we said a minute ago, God's love language is obediency, but it's also immediacy. What does that passage say? Immediately they got into the boat when Jesus told him to get in the boat. Immediately all of these things happened and they went on their way, and Jesus went on his way. And they began to, to take this sail across the sea. But immediately, a storm comes. Immediately, a storm begins to happen upon the sea. In verse 24, my, my translation says the word contrary. The wind was contrary. It means against. That's basically what it means. It, the wind is coming against you. Think about, be, as you think about this passage, think about being out there on that little boat on this big sea. The wind is coming against you. Can you just see that boat going up and down, up and down? You know, I've been out on barges when we would work with my family's company. We would go up to, to Virginia and get some of the old Navy sailing boats and bring them back down to our place by the river here on the Cape Fear to work on them and not work on them, but basically gut them so they could be set out to sea and be sunk to be reefs. And I remember riding some of the barges and some of the tugboats and sometimes it would be like this on that thing. And you would think being a Navy guy that that would have been okay with me, Bert, but it was a little disruptive to my, my whole being in those times because I didn't get on a boat when I was in the Navy. Can you believe serving in the United States Navy? I never got on a boat except to visit a friend. I got a shore station. How cool is that? So I didn't get on a boat. It's just God always has a plan. We don't always understand, right? So there we go. So they're out there on this boat, and then waves are just rolling. The wind is coming against them. Can you imagine what was going through their minds? It goes on for hours, not a few minutes, but hours. They're out there on that sea, and the waves are just going up and down all around. And that little boat is just you know, going like this, almost like a roller coaster. The wind is against them. They're chilled to the bone. You ever been out in a, in a storm? 
and the wind is blowing. We, we're used to storms around here, right? Um, it's just the way it is. But just think about those winds blowing against them, and it continues for hours and hours. And I'm sure they're drenched and they're dirty, they're chilled to the bone, and they're wondering, will we ever make it back to shore? Have you ever been in one of those life situations? You're wondering, what in the world is going on? Will I ever make it to the other side? And Jesus comes walking on the water. I want to make this statement to you before I go any further. Sometimes we face hardships in life as a consequence for our disobedience. But you know, there's other times we face hardships simply because we're obedient to God's Word. That's important. Sometimes you were obedient and you did everything God told you to do and you're like, why am I facing this situation? I had a saintly woman at Castle Hayne Baptist Church. Hazel Jenkins made an incredible statement to me before she passed away. She said, if you don't face the devil face to face, it's because you're going in the same direction. So when you do what God tells you to do, you're going to face Satan head on. Think about that for a second. There will be hardships sometimes because there's a battle. And Satan doesn't want you to go in the direction that God is calling you to go. So they're obedient. Jesus comes walking out on the water. My passage again says the fourth watch. By Roman thought process, the fourth watch was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. That tells us that they've been out there on that boat for a really long time, enduring all of this. And think about that. I think about this little kid song in my head. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. You guys remember that song? That's the first thing I think of when I think about this passage. But he's walking on the water and the disciples, they're already, they're drenched, they're tired, they're wore out, they're out of their minds. Wondering, are we ever going to get out of this storm? And then there's something walking on the water toward them. Think about that. They're terrified, right? They think they're seeing a ghost. How in the world is something walking on the water coming toward us? That's got to be a thought. That, can you imagine being in their situation and seeing all this going on around you and then a figure walking to you on the water? And what does Jesus say? Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Do you know there are over 365 times the scripture says do not be afraid? You think God's trying to tell you something there? 365 times. We have 365 days, right? There's a word for that for every day of our lives. Do not be afraid. It is I. Now, this is the equivalent of Exodus 3.14 where Moses is at the burning bush and he's getting ready or sending him over to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh. And he says, what is your name? Who is sending me? He said, I am who I am. So every time we hear Jesus make this statement, I am or it is I, he's saying, I am God and I'm everything that you need. Think about that for a second. I am God and I'm everything that you need. Everything that you need. That's what Jesus is telling them. They're in the midst of this storm and he says, I'm everything that you need. Verses 28 and 31. Peter is one of my favorite disciples, y'all. Peter asks Jesus this question. Hey, if it's you, Jesus, if it's really you, tell me to come out there on that water with you. Now, some of us think Peter's kind of, kind of a rebel. So I guess Bert, it's easy for me to get along with Peter because that seems to be my personality a lot of times. But he's a little brash. He's a little arrogant. He's a little headstrong. He kind of steps in sometimes, or maybe he should step back or opens his mouth up. This is where I really a lot like Peter. Opens his mouth up when I really should be quiet about something, right? My wife tells me that all the time. You didn't really have to say anything. So I can, I can relate to Peter. But Peter says, hey, if it's you, what does Jesus say? 
come. What does Peter do? Immediately, he steps out on the water. Can you imagine you just saw Jesus walking on the water and now you get to walk on the water too? I think that would be really fun. Remember, life is an adventure, right? What a great adventure it would be to walk out there on that water, Bert. Wouldn't that be fun? I would have so much fun with that. I love the water. I love being on the beach. One of my favorite things about moving back to Wilmington is being closer to the beach again. But he steps out there on that water. So what an incredible thrill that must be for him. But what does he do immediately once he realizes what's going on? He gets afraid and he begins to sink. What happened? He had the faith to get out of the boat, right? Colossians 3.1 is pretty clear. This is my translation, not verbatim from Scripture. But it says, set your eyes on things above. Not on what's right here. This is something that I think about so often in my life. I can't look here. I got to keep my eyes here. I got to keep my focus. You see, the storm never stopped. The winds never stopped. The rains never stopped. Nothing stopped. Everything was going just as it was when he took the step of faith. But once he realized what was going on, he took his eyes off Jesus because he began to look here. Y'all, a word of caution. Never look here. Look here. That's where the action is. That's where we need to keep our focus at all the time in life. Life is going to throw all kinds of things at you because that's the way life is. Things will happen. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Always fix your gaze on things above, not on the things of this earth. Because that's where the action is. Peter took his eyes off Jesus. But you know what? This is what I love. We, talk, we've been, we talked about prayer the other night. And Nehemiah, um, through prayer, we, we were talking about how some prayers are really long and elaborate. And you spend sometimes days and times in fasting and prayer. But then sometimes it's just, Lord, save me. Lord, I need you. Lord, something that simple is a prayer, right? That's a simple prayer. And what does Jesus do immediately? He reaches down and he pulls him up and they both get into the boat. But then he looks at him and he says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now I want to make something clear here. I don't think that he was reprimanding Peter for, for not getting out of the boat. That wasn't it at all. But it's the doubt. You guys get in that situation and you're doing everything you know to do and then you just doubt God to be true to his word. You know, it, all the way back in the garden, I think about this, when Eve, she knew God's word. She knew his voice. She'd heard it through her husband. She heard it through God himself. But when Satan came to her, he twisted God's word just enough that she doubted God's word to be true. It's when you doubt God's word to be true, you're willing to do anything and everything. When you don't believe God and his word to be true, we have to stand firm on God's Word. In our day and culture we live in today, y'all, we need to be standing firm on God's Word, come what may. No compromise. Stand firmly on the foundation of God's Word. So he said, why did you doubt? But the others in the boat immediately realized it was God. And they began to worship him. Y'all, we need to remember, regardless of what's going on, what storms in life we are facing, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. There's a song 
It's called eye of the storm. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eyes of the storm. So when you're facing those storms in life, because they will come. If you're not in one now, take it from me. They will come. My family, even before I married Nisha, we have faced some tremendous storms. Since Nisha and I have been married, we have faced tremendous storms. We have faced conflict. We have faced, when we left here, I, I told you this earlier, when we left here, people thought we were the dumbest people on the planet. Why would you go somewhere? Everybody we knew would go to Southeastern and they would live here and they would drive back and forth to go to school. Why can't you do that? Keep your jobs. Keep your house. What's the big deal? Because that's not what God told us to do. Plain and simple. Sometimes when you do what God told you to do, it's not common sense. I'm all about some common sense. I'm all about using your brain to do things. But with this life of faith, it's not about common sense. Sometimes it's totally contrary. Kind of like the wind was contrary. It's not about common sense. It's about just trusting God in the word that he has given you and trust his word to be true and step out into whatever situation that is. And y'all, I am living proof that my God is faithful and that he is true. And he has never left me alone. He's always walked with my family and I we are grateful for the journey, the ups and the downs and everything in between because my God has proven himself to be faithful and true. So I want to say something to you, and I know with everything that's going on here, you'll understand this probably better than other people, but we're all going to die someday. It's just a fact of life. Some of us sooner, some of us later. My sister died when she was 29. My dad died when he was 57. So that makes me a little anxious because he died at 57 with a heart attack. His dad died when he was 59 of a heart attack. Do you want to know how old I am? I'm almost 51. So that makes me a little anxious when I think about that sometimes and I'm having all these heart issues. My God is faithful. So I have to be honest with you, I don't even fear. Some of my friends asked me the last time I was in the hospital, what were you thinking when they had to shock your heart? You know what I was thinking? The very scripture that I have shared with Pastor Burt multiple times lately. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. The Lord leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me to all these places through the valley of the shadow of death. But I won't fear. Why? Because my God is with me. His rod, his staff protects me. That's exactly what I was thinking that day in the hospital. I wasn't thinking about anything else other than I did have a good view of the little machine there that was telling me my blood pressure, my heart rate. My wife was saying, would you please move that? No, I need to see that. I need to know what's going on. I like to know what's going on all the time. That's my problem sometimes. I'm like this instead of focused like I should be because I get all into everything. But I need to fix my eyes on Jesus. So think about that. There's a statement here that says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done with Christ will last. You see, I don't know about y'all, but I want to live every moment. I want to live every moment on adventure with God and pursuing His kingdom. It's all about God's kingdom. Sometimes we get lost in all of this. Some of you probably talk politics more than you talk anything else. That's temporary, y'all. Whoever's in the White House, they can't save you. Only King Jesus saves, okay? Do you understand that? 
We can get lost in all the things that are going on in this world when Jesus says, just fix your eyes on me, the King, the Savior, the Lord of the universe. I'm all that you need. Do you understand that today? I want to live my life with my eyes fixed upon Jesus. You see, I understand staying in the boat. It's pretty safe. It's pretty comfortable compared to what's out there on the open sea. But you know what? We want to sometimes make fun of, fun of Peter. But who are we talking about today? Are we talking about Peter or the other ones that stayed in the boat? We're talking about Peter, the one that stepped out in faith, trusting God to be true and to be everything that he needed. That's the person we are talking about today. All these years later, look, it's possible, it's risky when you get out there on the water and, and, and it may be uncomfortable, like I said a minute ago, it may be hard and you may sink. But guess what? God is everything that you need. When you go to the highest peaks, when you go to the lowest valleys, God is there. King Jesus. Our lives should only be about one thing. If we're believers in this room today, should be about living for the kingdom and living for the king. That's what our lives should be focused on today. You see, anything is possible with our big God. So we need to trust him to be true to his word. I'll give you that definition again of faith. Believing God to be true and committing your life to him. Believing God to be true and committing your life to him. Let me ask you something. Some of you are thinking, my life of adventure is behind me, brother. I'm in my, my retirement years. I'm going to relax. How old was Noah when God called him to build that boat in the middle of the desert? Y'all know how old he was? 100? 100 years old. Now, some of you are saying, I'm older. I don't know. How many of you are 100 in this room today? Somebody might be, but is there a 100-year-old in this room today? So you ain't too old to get out there and live that life of adventure God's called you to live. Amen? Seriously. There are no limits with our big God. Anything, church, is possible with our big God. Say the word big. big. God. God. Now say it like you really mean it. Big. big. God. That's pretty simple, right? Trusting our big God to be true regardless of our life situation. Life is an adventure or it's nothing at all. Some of you need to get out of the boat today. And you need to try walking on water. Maybe you're here today and you've never even entered into this great adventure of life that we call the Christian life. We call living in the kingdom. Maybe you've never done that today. Jesus, just like he, he reached down and pulled Peter up out of the sinking water, that's what he did for each one of us on the cross. He didn't ask us to do anything he said, just take my hand. And he reaches down and he pulls you up. Scripture says, Jesus in his own words says, there isn't any other way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to my Father but through me. So maybe you need to come into this life of adventure and faith through Jesus Christ today. This is your time to do that. Maybe you're here and, and you've been a believer for many years. But maybe you've never really trusted God's word to be true and you committed your life to him. Maybe you have a church membership here, wherever. But you've never really began this truly living the life of faith. You see, I tell people all the time something. Everybody wants Jesus as Savior, but not too many people want him as Lord. You've got to have Jesus as Savior and Lord. They go together. There's no one or the other. There's only the one together, Savior, Lord. 
Savior is someone who saves you from danger. Lord is someone you submit your life to and you do what they tell you to do, no matter what it is. Savior and Lord. So maybe some of you today need to recognize that. Maybe whatever God is calling you to do at this moment, this is your time right now. Whatever you need to do. I don't know how you normally close it out, but So what I would normally say is something very simple. The altar is open. I do believe there's something incredible about praying here at this place. Yes, you can do that in your seats. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. We would love to do that with you today. Whatever the Lord leads, this is your time. I'll stand through page 285.